don't use the word innovative. I have a spiel about the word experimental. I'm not particularly attached to that label and would consider it a tool of marketing if there were a market for experimental <laughs> uh, But that I think there's some utility to it. I mean, aside from the kind of utility it has in large institutions like publishing and academia, uh, that it does to me have some utility with respect to the practice of writing, which for me, involves experimenting. I often think of myself as a language engineer more than a writer. I don't feel particularly inspired to write. I feel like I like to pose myself problems, in my case, particularly formal problems, and attempt to solve them. And in that sense, I am, I spend a lot of the time experimenting. <laughs> I was gonna say, I think one of the advantages uh, of thinking about this kind of writing in terms of tradition is that you get to see what need there is for this kind of anthology because you see um, certainly uh, in the history of the avant-garde modernist and postmodernist projects are so overwhelmingly male dominated mm -hmm. right. that thinking again in traditional terms makes it clear that there's a vacuum, there's a need, there's practice that is going underrepresented. In my teaching I often use the word counter-traditional um, precisely because it contains the word traditional, and that implies that we're all working within literary traditions, and there are multiple and long traditions of counter-traditional work, and as long as there's been the modern novel, there's been counter-traditional prose. I think of Tristram Shandy, published in 1749, is a perfect uh, demonstration of that. And I think it behooves us to know that we're writing inside of traditions. I don't find myself compromised by that or that it means that I'm not innovative or experimental or avant-garde uh, because I think the alternative to writing inside of a tradition is basically to be a wolf boy or wolf girl in the woods and the compromise of living a social life I'm willing to make, you know, if it means I'm operating inside of a tradition, the more I know about the tradition, the more conscious I can make my choices about how I'm operating and how I'm situating myself with respect to it. And in fact, usually they, not in multiple traditions, usually at work at any given moment. So I've had um, experiences with students who find it very liberating and permission granting to encounter uh, experimental prose. And I also encounter a lot of resistance. And I had one student in a workshop who said, in defense of plots, and I was not attacking plots, plots, I was saying, there are other things also available to you. And he got very upset and he said, but the reason we have plots is we're born, we live, and we die. And luckily there was someone else in the room who had taken a course with me in the previous semester and he said, um, or because we're trained to read plots. <laughs> it's a bingo. And, but they, a lot of students I think feel personally uh, aggrieved to be presented with an alternative as though it is a degradation of the plot, the character, to which they're really very attached. And I say, go to. There is also a whole other set of possibilities. Yeah. And I think that the function of academic institutions is to reproduce themselves. And so as creative writing proliferates as a discipline, it does what other disciplines do, which is participate in the self-reproduction of academic institutions. Uh, and one of the reasons that I think it's it has potentially political effect to read work, I'm thinking of um, people have other examples of work that their students have been upset by. My students were very upset by reading Gertrude Stein. One of them said she was physically nauseated by <laughs> reading it. I had to remember that I once had trouble reading Richard Stein's work myself. Uh, but I thought it's very useful. I tried to convince them it is useful to be destabilized. So go there and come back, but have gone there as writers. And I think one of the things that seems to me prevalent in um, kind of dominant paradigms in creative writing programs uh, in this country at this time is that there's a kind of resurgence of humanism, that what makes great literature great is simply that it's great and that's why we read it because it's great and there's I think a kind of a nostalgic hope that the way back towards some kind of intact social life is through humanities on the part of a lot of writers and so there's 
um, with that, I think, an appeal to kind of conventional narrative toward non-destabilizing kind of textual practices and effects. And that goes hand in hand with a kind of anti-theoretical stance that I personally find self-defeating and anti-intellectual. Uh, and it's because what a lot of literary theory does is say, well, great literature isn't great just because it's intrinsically great. It's great because of certain kinds of institutional practices and certain kinds of histories and certain histories of aesthetic judgment such that we know what we think is great and we know that this kind of work falls outside of that until, you know, until it's Gertrude Stein. Uh, so I think potentially there's, there's political practice in trying to destabilize that kind of humanist assumption underneath teaching and writing Again, not that writing with conventions is bad, and not that we can escape writing with conventions or teaching conventionally, for that matter, um, but to provide alternatives seems like potentially a way of um, kind of breaking, at least trying to break into the unbelievable, the kind of deeply intractable tendency of academic institutions to reproduce themselves, which is a conservative tendency.